Minister, Harper, it's my great pleasure to welcome you back to Davos for your second participation here. Your visit today comes just eight months after your resounding victory in national elections. Indeed, I think much to the envy of many leaders here in the audience and elsewhere, you managed actually to increase your standing in Parliament, passing from minority to a majority government for the next several years. Canada is recognized for having navigated the waters of the international financial crisis in a very impressive manner. Your own personal leadership in this regard, together with the sound regulatory and business context for which Canada is so well known, have served the country very well. Prime Minister, we look forward to hearing your impressions of the current state of the global economy and in particular, the role and contribution that what many people call the Canadian model can make to improve the, the current economic challenges facing much of the industrial life world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Prime Minister Harpoff of Canada. Thank you, uh, Professor Schwab, for that uh, kind introduction. I also uh, want to thank you particularly for the invitation to speak here that you extended to me earlier this year. But more than that, uh, Professor, you have made the World Economic Forum an, indispen an indispensable part of the global conversation among leaders in politics, business, and civil society. And in the face of continuing global economic instability, the opportunity that this gathering provides is now more valuable than ever. So I know everyone here joins me in thanking you for, in the service really of the common good, your leadership and your vision. My greetings to Ambassador Santi, to the Governor of the Bank of Canada, known internationally as Chair of the Financial Stability Board, Mark Carney, to our hardworking Minister of International Trade, Ed Fast and as the best finance minister on the planet, Jim Clarity. That's an official title, he tells me. And let me just say that I'm especially proud to see so many outstanding Canadian business leaders making their presence felt here in Davos. Ladies and gentlemen, I will use my time today to highlight Canada's economic strength and to frame the choices we face as we work to secure long-term prosperity for our citizens. In a difficult global environment, and I should say, and instability that in a difficult global environment uh, is likely to remain with us. Comme vous le savez, le Canada a connu une performance économique supérieure à la plupart des pays développés au cours de ces dernières années de l'économie mondiale. Forbes magazine ranks Canada as the best place on the planet for businesses to grow and create jobs. The OECD and the IMF predict our economy will again be among the leaders of the industrialized world over the next two years. And one more cherished accolade, of course, is that for the fourth year in a row, this body, the World Economic Forum, says our banks are the soundest in the world. These evaluations are the result of sound fundamentals. Among G7 countries, Canada has the lowest overall tax rate and new business investment. Our net debt to GDP ratio remains the lowest in the G7 and by far. And while we remain concerned about the number of Canadians who are still out of work, Canada is one of only two G7 countries to have recouped all of the jobs lost during the global recession. Indeed, more Canadians are now working than before the downturn. How was this achieved? Confronté à la pire crise économique mondiale depuis des années, notre gouvernement a mis en œuvre des mesures de plus rapides économiques parmi les plus importantes et les plus 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 les
support for workers who lost their job. These things we did on a timely, targeted, and temporary basis. We did not create permanent new programs for government bureaucracy. As, our, as a consequence, our deficit is now solid, our debt GDP ratio has already peaked, and we do not need to raise taxes going forward. I should add, we also did not reduce immigration or give in to protectionism. Instead, we've maintained the high levels of immigration that our aging labor force of the future will require. We have continued as well to pursue new trade agreements, and we have taken action to make Canada among the G20, among G20 countries the first tariff-free zone for manufacturers. Nous avons mis en place des priorités We have pursued these policies, ladies and gentlemen, once again because our number one priority as a government is prosperity, that is economic growth and job creation. Now that may sound obvious, almost cliché, but is it really? As I look around the world, as I look particularly at developed countries, I worry, I wonder, and I ask whether the creation of economic growth and therefore jobs really is the number one policy priority everywhere? Or is it the case that in the developed world, too many of us have in fact become complacent about our prosperity, taking our wealth as a given, assuming it is somehow the natural order of things, leaving us instead to focus primarily on our services and entitlements? Is it a coincidence that as the veil falls on the financial crisis, it reveals beneath it not just too much bank debt, but too much sovereign debt, too much general willingness to have standards and benefits beyond our ability or even our willingness to pay for it. Now, I don't know, but what I do know is this. Premièrement, que la richesse de l'économie occidentale n'entend rien plus inévitable que la pauvreté First, the that the wealth of the Western economy. economy is no more inevitable than the poverty of emerging ones. And that the wealth we enjoy today has been based on and only on good growth-oriented policies, the right often tough choices, and the hard work done in the past. And second, that regardless of what direction other Western nations may choose, under our government, Canada will make the transformations necessary to sustain economic growth, job creation, and prosperity now and for the next generation. Cela veut dire deux choses. Nous devons prendre de meilleures décisions économiques dès maintenant et nous préparer dès maintenant aux pressions démographiques auxquelles l'économie canadienne fait face. That further means two things, making better choices, better economic choices now, and preparing ourselves for the democratic pressures, the Canadian, the demographic pressures, excuse me, that the Canadian economy faces. On what we must do now, first, we will, of course, continue to keep taxes, tax rates down. That is central to our government's economic vision. But we will do more, much more. In the months to come, our government will undertake major transformations to position Canada for growth over the next generation. For example, we will continue to make key investments in science and technology necessary to sustain a modern competitive economy. But we believe that Canada's less than optimal results for those investments is a significant problem for our country. We've recently received a report on this, the Jenkins Report, and we will soon act on the problem the report identifies. We will continue to advance our trade linkages. We will pass agreements signed, particularly in our own hemisphere, and we will work to conclude major deals beyond it. Comme vous le savez, nous nous attendons à compléter les négociations d'un accord de libre échange avec l'Europe cette année. We expect to complete negotiations on a Canada-EU free trade agreement this year. We will work to complete negotiations on a free trade agreement with India in 2013, and we will begin entry talks with the Trans-Pacific Partnership while also pursuing other avenues, 
to advance our trade in Asia. I will, of course, for example, be making another official visit to China very shortly. We will also continue working with the Obama administration to implement our joint Beyond the Border initiative. This is our plan to deepen our economic and security links to our most important partners. However, at the same time, we will make it a national priority, a priority to ensure we have the capacity to export our energy products beyond the United States and specifically to Asia. In this regard, we will soon take action to ensure that major energy and mining projects are not subject to unnecessary regulatory delays, that is, delays merely for the sake of delay. This complements work we're already doing and that we will move forward on with the Canadian Federation of Independent Business to cut the burden of red tape for entrepreneurs. We will also undertake significant reform of our immigration system. We will ensure that while we respect our humanitarian obligations and our family reunification objectives, we will make our economic and labor force needs the central goal of our immigration efforts in the future. As I said earlier, one of the backdrops for my concerns is Canada's aging population. If not addressed promptly, this has the capacity to undermine Canada's economic position, and for that matter, that of all Western nations, well beyond the current economic crisis. Immigration does help us address that, and will even more so in the future. Notre situation démocratique représente aussi une menace pour les programmes sociaux et les services que les Canadiens et les Canadiennes ont en cœur. En cœur. C'est pourquoi nous prendrons des mesures importantes dans les mois à venir. Our demographics also constitute a threat to the social programs and services that Canadians cherish. For this reason, we will be taking measures in the coming months, not just to return to a balanced budget over the medium term, but also to ensure the sustainability of our social programs and our fiscal position over the next generation. We've already taken steps to limit the growth of our health care spending over that period. We must do the same for our retirement income system. Fortunately, the centerpiece of that system, the Canada Pension Plan, is fully funded, actuarially sound, and does not need to be changed. For those elements of the system that are not funded, we will make the changes necessary to ensure sustainability for the next generation while not affecting current recipients. Now let me summarize, uh, ladies and gentlemen, by saying this. That notwithstanding Canada's many advantages, we remain very concerned about the continuing instability of the global economy of which we are very much a part. The problems afflicting Europe, and for that matter the United States, are not only challenging today, but in my judgment, threaten even greater problems in the future. Ceci étant dit, chaque pays has son propre choix à faire. And he said that each nation has a choice to make. Western nations in particular face the choice of whether to create the conditions for growth and prosperity or to risk long-term economic decline. In every decision or failure to decide, we are choosing our future right now. And as we all know, both from the global crises of the past few years and from past experience in our own country, easy choices now mean fewer choices later. Le choix du Canada sera de façon claire et sans détour de prendre en main et de maîtriser notre avenir, d'être un modèle de confiance croissance et de prospérité pour le 21e siècle. Canada's choice will be, with clarity and urgency, to seize and to master our future to be a model of confidence, growth, and prosperity in the 21st century economy. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention.